What I'd like to kind of do this morning basically is to share some things if you're going to let me come back next week because you don't have time to hear everything I have to say today, I can assure you of that. Uh, we can definitely schedule but, but I, I would like to, today, part two yeah, and I'll just try to share some introductory things. I want to talk specifically more about a philosophy and a strategy of dr addressing childhood poverty. You know, I've been studying this for like 57 years, I lived it for the first 25 years of my life in the southern western coal fields of Fed County, St. Lawrence County, and, and my beloved Mount Hope, West Virginia. So poverty has always been very near and dear to me, and I've tried to figure out for the last 30 some years, well, how do you help people break the cycle of it. And that's why I've given my life to the last 20 years on the west side of Charleston. Um, how this would advance, um, Paul. OK. All right, uh, we don't, this was kind of an outline I prepared. And I, I hit on a couple of these things, get into more of some details the next time I come. But I want to answer three fundamental questions. And first of all, why are children in poverty? Uh, it's fundamental and it's pretty simple. Children in poverty. Uh, as a result of nothing that they've done. But they are born into families or they're in families where their parents are guarded for some reason or another, are undereducated, underskilled, un underemployed, unemployable, or they lack economic opportunity. It's that simple. Children in poverty because of the lack of opportunity, lack of skills, the lack of employment, the lack of the ability of the parents to provide for them. That's number one. Secondly, the factors is what I've been hearing when I listen on the radio, and people talk, spoken very eloquently and very accurately about the factors that contribute to poverty, from poor education, school dropout, lack of potential substance abuse, domestic violence, a lack of affordable child care, lack of transportation, no driver's license, something Senator Larry and I've talked quite a bit about, of how people with minor uh, criminal offenses in with no driver's license, therefore they can't get to work and hold a job, a criminal record, et cetera. Now, these are the factors as to why adults often are marginalized, unable to be employed. And why is the cycle perpetuated from generation to generation? Because poverty is cyclical all over the United States of America and all over the world, and particularly in West Virginia. Why is it cyclical? Children perpetuate the cycle of poverty because they don't obtain the basic educational skills during the K-12 educational experience, prepare them for workforce, uh, or the workforce, or preferably prepare them for post-education to prepare them to be employable and live, live a living wage job. That's the bottom line. Poverty is perpetuated because children do not get the educational skills they need to enter the workforce in the 21st century or the skills necessary for post-secondary education where they can make a livable wage. That's the bottom line. That's why the cycle is perpetuated. Now, there are factors that contribute to the perpetuation of the childhood poverty. The factors are things we heard about earlier, uh, poor early childhood development, Poor K through five, poor six through 12, child abuse and neglect, domestic violence, truancy, length for teen pregnancies, homelessness, et cetera. These are the factors often that break kids' spirits, uh, leads to them being uninterested in school, not attending school, and when they're not performing. These are the factors we have to deal with to address childhood poverty. But there's a major thing, I'm gonna give you an assignment. And there's an assignment that I think that it would be helpful for this body to undertake. And I've spoken a lot about a report, and I hope that some of you have read it. It's the most impressive report I've ever see, seen produced in the state of West Virginia, ever. And I've read a lot of reports. It's the big picture spending summary, the most impressive report I've ever seen produced. Um, the big picture spending summary, West Virginia Children and Families preliminary funding report. And I think my good friend Sam Hickman may have worked on this report. It was compiled first back 1990 to 2001. Uh, issued by the Western Division of Criminal Justice Services. The study focused on 252, 252 different funding streams, federal, state, and local, that brought in at that time $5.2 billion administered by various Western state agencies to deal with issues affecting children and families in poverty. The most impressive report you probably ever see the state government produce. It maps all these funding streams, it maps where the money goes to, the agencies it go to. Now, they put the report in these functional areas, healthcare, education support, education, safety and family stability, economic development, and community capacity building. That's the way the report, report is put together. Easy to follow. Now, what was the premise? They came together, these state agencies, interagency groups, they came together, they said, because a lot of kids have not been properly served. A lot of kids have been underserved. Why? Because they said, we don't have a coordinated comprehensive planning process. Okay, I have to refer to that. We have no way to plan what we're doing that will provide adequate and appropriate resources where they were most needed. That's a quote from the Big, Pen uh, big Picture Spending Summary, Executive Summary. 
They went on to say there's a lack of agreement upon statewide, statewide goals for improving service delivery and child well-being, lack of accountability for reaching programming goals, lack of information about family services, lack of information about availability and use of child family services in West Virginia. They came with this before they got started and why they were motivated to put this report together. They looked at federal state funding streams that were included in the analysis that benefit children directly, that supported families, and that strengthened communities. Now, this was in 2001 when the report was issued, about $5.2 billion, and here is the categories in terms of how that money is allocated. Now, I know we're about out of time, but I want to bring a couple of things to your attention. Look at the amount of money that's allocated toward youth development, a little over one-tenth of one percent. Look at the amount of money that goes toward community capacity, a little over a quarter of one percent. The amount of money for, for housing. Look at what's allocated to economic development. Now, I want to show a couple more things, and then I know we've got to get up out of here. Uh, this is a quite busy slide. The next one will be a better presentation. Now, this is the two, 2007. This is the last time this report has been updated in 2007. On the education, you see the breakdown. How much of the money who comes in education comes from the federal government? How much comes from the state government? So you see early child ed education, almost 63% comes from the federal government. Public education, large percentage, 86% comes from the state. Higher education, of course, the state at 96%. The total education budget, you see there. Uh, the monies. And there's an additional $816.5 million that come from the local counties. This is education. Over three plus billion dollars to go toward public education. Healthcare, you see the breakdown. If how much money comes from the federal government, over 71, nearly 71 percent. How much comes from the state? About 30 percent. Economic support, you see the breakdown. Uh, what comes from the federal government? The majority of it comes from the federal government. 96.9 or 9%, 97% of the money for economic support, as outlined there, comes from the federal government. 3.1% from the state. Total economic development, and you see that. Most of the money comes from the federal government. It does economic development as it's related to economic development to help children, families, and strengthen communities. Now, this is a summary of what it looks like uh, in terms of the total education, what's the state, what's the federal government, and what the breakdown is. Now, here's where I think it's really, it's really pretty serious. When you look at what we're spending, total economic development, 1.2%. That's why poor people remain poor, because we do not have a plan, nor are we financing economic development in poor neighborhoods that's going to generate jobs and that's going to help people to have livable wage or jobs. Now, something that's even more alarming than that is when you look at the fact that we spend, the state of West Virginia spends almost zero dollars on workforce development. When I came to the state uh, workforce investment board in 2000, the federal government was sending us 44 million dollars for workforce development. Now we get about $12 million from the federal government from workforce development. So I basically our workforce development system, this doesn't include higher education or the community technical college, but the workforce development system that's under Commerce Secretary, basically that's all it has to run the workforce investment system. That's the challenges that we have. At the end of the day, we will not be able to move people out of poverty. We will not be able to move children out of poverty. Now I close with this. In the medium term, mid term, children will remain in poverty unless we're able to engage their parents in meaningful job training that prepares them for employment. They will remain in poverty. Now, we can help children break the cycle of poverty, but of course, that's not going to happen if they become adults. And so what I would encourage this body to, to really take a look at, and I'll send you more detail, I've sent this around several times, uh, when you look at what we're not doing in terms of workforce development, we do not have a comprehensive, holistic, strategic, sensible workforce development approach in West Virginia, particularly in the communities where, they need, where it's needed the most. 
And lastly, I'll say this, the Annie Casey report, which I think I sent to Paul Sheridan, 56,000 56, young people between 16 to 24 in West Virginia, out of school and out of work. 20% of them already have children. The highest percentage of children in the nation out of school and out of work is in West Virginia. You have to target that group of 16 to 24 years with job training uh, skills to lead to employment because their children are in poverty right now and their children will remain in poverty and their parents will remain in poverty. And that is the population that's coming toward our criminal justice system at 56,000. So what we're doing now with prison reform, we're trying to address the sins of the past, but we've got something coming at us that's more daunting than our current overcrowding problem. And that's the 56,000 young people disconnected from school and disconnected from work. I'd like to come back at some time and get right into details and specifics of an approach that has to be community-based, anchored in neighborhoods and communities, because you can't address childhood poverty in generalities, because kids live in families, they live in neighborhoods, and they live in communities. And so there has to be a structured approach in terms of what you're trying to do to strengthen families, build community capacity, and to provide workforce development that leads to employment and economic development in the context of neighborhoods and communities. And we've looked very, very intently at that uh, on the west side of Charleston, which has one of the highest poverty concentrations in the state. So I'll be more than glad to you can have the entire presentation here. It's already loading this machine. Uh, Paul can print it out. I know you guys got to get to the floor. I'm out of my time. I thank you for yours.